Great, so uh, obviously I couldn't bring the ATMs here. Um, it certainly doesn't fit the uh, carry-on baggage limit. So instead what I'm going to try and do is stream it from uh, California, where I've got the two ATMs. Um, I have my assistant there, uh, and I'm basically going to try and hack it remotely. And we'll see how it goes. So I'm going to check that the stream's up real quick. Okay, so so these are two ATMs in my apartment, and um, I came here from. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't, right? Um, and I came from Buenos Aires, where I lost my cell phone. So I'm actually going to need to make an international call and borrow a phone if that's all right. <laughs> but if that's not going to happen, I guess I'll Skype. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to have to call it from Skype. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool, bro. This is going to be a real test to the demo gods, by the way. Hello? <laughs> Are you awake? Okay, come, come in front of the ATMs and wave really quickly. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So I'm just making sure it's working. Okay, I'll call you back in probably 30 minutes. Alright, bye. Okay, cool. Okay, back to the presentation. Jackpotting automated teller machines. Um, this has interested me since I was a kid, since I saw Terminator 2, where uh, John Connor plugs his, thing, his Atari into the uh, ATM and spits out money. So, you know, they tell you TV doesn't have an influence on you, but pretty much since then it's always been something I've wanted to give a crack at. So, uh, we'll just get right started, I suppose. Uh, so the current attacks that are out there at the moment, the skimmer, which of course is the uh, the fan favorite, you know, it's the uh, overlay which slides over the uh, the card slot and the pin pad. These are manufactured to blend seamlessly with the ATMs I designed for. So, you know, it'll capture your uh, track data as well as the pin numbers, usually like a, a little camera set up or the overlay. Um, some of the, the technology on some of these is no joke now too, where it'll capture it, send the details back to the attacker over SMS and all types of things, have tamper protection where it wipes itself out when it's discovered, which is pretty cool. And you have 
uh, physical theft and ram raids. Everyone's probably seen those YouTube videos where uh, a couple of good old boys will go through the uh, front window of a store with their pickup truck, attach uh, a chain to the ATM, the other to the truck, and belt off of it. Not the most subtle of attacks, of course, but you know, it's uh, ninja status compared to some of the other ones. And then we have our card trapping, card snooping. Um, essentially where someone wants to insert a small shim into the card slot where it's designed to uh, actually catch the cards, not return it, but uh, then someone will come up to whoever's using the ATM and be like, oh, you know, something wrong with your cards, wait here while I go into the bank, la da da da, grab it. And then safe cutting frontal attacks, essentially going at the ATM with a pair of pliers and a blowtorch. And then uh, explosives, which I find surprisingly popular. Um, the attack is literally tying a bunch of explosives to an ATM, blowing the living crap out of it. And you think that would actually be somewhat counterproductive to what you're trying to achieve, but in, uh, that's big in Australia, so go figure, you know. And uh, data breaches, uh, hacking the bank processor, harvesting the card data and pins. And I suppose the, uh, the best example of this would have been the, uh, the hack of the uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, Scotland back end. And uh, I think they took them for about nine million. I think the guy was recently caught. Um, and then of course, miscellaneous or other. Uh, I suppose it was a default passcode attack from a couple of years ago where the uh, manufacturers would um, ship out the ATMs with a default passcode, get into that, get into the operator menu, um, uh, change the denomination so it thinks it's giving you $5 bills when it's really giving you 20s and that type of thing. And I'll add a few more to the other category, which in my opinion are blow John Connors crap right out the water. <laughs> Uh, so I've picked standalone ATMs and there's a few reasons for that. At least in the United States, they're fairly easy to get a hold of. You simply uh, jump on the internet and add to cart. So uh, I just ordered them directly from the distributors. Um, but getting the ATMs delivered to your house, of course, is quite interesting. The dude literally uh, rolls in an ATM and not surprising, he's like, why on earth do you need an ATM in your house? And so I'm a little bit hungover at the time, so I'm feeling a bit cheeky. I'm just like, oh, I just don't like the transaction fees, mate. <laughs> and he kind of just shakes his head and uh, sort of goes on his way. Uh, but also they're everywhere, right? So at least in the States, every bar, convenience store, market, and they're often in secluded areas. So, you know, they're out by the restroom, tucked away in corners. So I'm going to discuss attack methods for standalones as well as hole-in-the-wall ATMs. So I'm going to start off with talking about walk-up style attacks. Now I'm going to switch to the more important vector, in um, my opinion, which is the remote attack. And uh, what you can leverage through a successful remote compromise of an ATM. And when I say remote, I mean default because you know, that's the only way to roll, really. So just to give you a <laughs> quick overview of how many of these ATMs are around, this, this is about... Uh, half block radius from my house. I just figured I'd uh, jump around, take a few snaps to some ATMs out there. All these ones are vulnerable to the attacks that I'm going to be demonstrating. Um, <laughs> this guy who owns the uh, local Mexican restaurant, I had him put his bottle of tapatio on top of the ATM. Doesn't exactly look uh, too chuffed to be in the photo, mind. <laughs> So the standard specs of a new model retail style ATM, uh, Windows CE generally with an ARM-based processor, new model support, both TCIP, TCP IP and dial-up by default, optional wireless, but when I say wireless, I mean our CDMA, not 802.11, so unfortunately no drive-by ATM looting. No such luck there, I suppose. But um, it's SSL support and a triple disk encrypted pin pad. So basically the pin pad performs all the encryption on the device itself, but I'll talk more about that beast a little later too. Actually, is there any water, by the way? Okay, Thanks, bro. <laughs> I'm a little bit parched. Um, so here's the ATM internals from one of the ATMs I have in my place. Uh, you have the receipt printer over to the right there. You can see the card reader, um, USB slots, SD cards. Uh, is a JTAG port, a couple of debugging ports there. Um, the only thing changed with this compared to the original ATM is I've just removed the faceplate from the ATM, simply just to show to be able to show the circuit board. 
But I guarantee that the ATMs I'll be demonstrating on at home are completely untouched, completely unmodified. And funnily enough, of all the possible ways, so I originally gave this talk in, uh, in Las Vegas, and there are a few issues, of course, uh, getting the talk underway. Funnily enough, uh, the... Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Funny enough, um, the way it was almost disrupted was by my cat, who was being a cheeky little bugger, and I had a USB keyboard plugged in. He was chasing a moth or something, ripped out the USB cord, pulled off the processor board, and like snapped the USB off. But luckily, he only ruined the USB. You could solder it back in. But anyway, bad kitty. So I'm not going to give a full-blown technical tutorial. Uh, I'm going to follow up with a white paper a little bit later, which will go into more of the technical details on how this stuff was developed. Um, but I'm basically, I'll sum up the hurdles that I faced with uh, this quote. We were concerned about protection, but not about security. We weren't trying to design an airtight system like Windows NT. And that was... <laughs> And that was from uh, Thomas Fenwick, who was the creator of the Windows CE kernel. And this came from a book called Inside Windows CE, which was actually a bunch of interviews with um, the developers of Windows CE. And it gives some sort of background into the design. So uh, essentially not many roadblocks. So before I can either, even think about giving the dude from Terminator 2 a run for his money, the first step is to be able to interface with the ATM itself. Um, we need to gain access to the file system so we can pull the files and be able to do some reverse engineering and actually locate the vulnerabilities. But with CE, um, when the ATM boots up, it doesn't boot to any sort of explorer shell. It boots directly to the proprietary application, which is the ATM software. So we basically need a shell to make things easier so we can actually copy files off and whatnot. Um, so to get a shell, we need to actually get explorer to boot when the ATM is booting up. So the C application boot sequence is pretty straightforward. Uh, the kernel nkxe executes filesys.exe. Filesys sets up both the registry and the file system, and then executes the applications listed in uh, the registry key hklm init. So the trick is we want to patch our application into that boot list. Uh, so there's a couple of ways we can do that. The first approach um, assumes you actually have a copy of the Windows C image. Um, the registry file can then be extracted, modified, recompiled into the image, and then you need to rewrite the flash via either JTAG, serial, Ethernet, what have you. And the other approach is to actually patch and explore um, live while debugging, which of course requires some sort of debugging capability, JTAG, Ethernet, serial, etc. So I decided to take uh, the JTAG route, just because it's a fairly straightforward way to accomplish our goals. And just for those who don't know, JTAG is essentially a uh, hardware debug debugging interface, which gives you kind of unrestricted debugging access to the core, implemented on most embedded devices, and in particular, definitely the ARM processor. And the hardware used to be pretty pricey for this stuff, but these days you get it for less than 100 bucks, thanks to our open source developments like Open on Chip Debug. Uh, so with JTAG access now, I can remotely debug with GDB, I can debug the kernel, the bootloader, and so on. And uh, JTAG's been talked about to death, and there's a lot of resources online for that, so hunt for more info. Uh, so it probably seems a bit obvious, but the use of hardware debuggers and things of that nature have absolutely nothing to do with the attacks themselves. Uh, just used to simply gain initial access to the system to actually be able to perform some vulnerability research. Now, speaking of JTAG, um, when I had it plugged in on one of the ATMs, I accidentally wiped out all the ATM software on the device. And at the time, I had no way to actually get the ATM software without being a licensed distributor. So I had to call a uh, licensed ATM technician to come around to my house. <laughs> so they, they send three guys around and again, it's like, why do you have an ATM in your house? You know, and I'm like, oh, you know, I haven't moved it into my store yet and all this type of thing. And it's like, he's like, how on earth did you wipe out all the data on this ATM? And I said, oh, I was trying to change the spash screen. You know, I put it in an SSD card and it just completely killed everything. He's like, Oh yeah, they'll do that, mate. They'll do that. So he uh, he pops open the ATM and he's like, show it basically. He basically taught me how to hack an ATM in a day, right? And I uh, got his business cards. We kept in touch. Um, I think after the presentation, though, that relationship certainly severed, unfortunately. But the lesson there is always back up your firmware first. Now 
now, by the way, actually, I'm such a great customer of these ATM distributors, they give me absolutely anything I ask for now. Uh, so, now that we can debug, uh, we need to inject. So, with the debugger connected, we um, simply set a breakpoint on create process. Um, the offset was found by dumping the memory from the ATM and doing a, just a byte compare with an offline version of uh, core DLL, which is essentially like the kernel equivalent of like NTDLL on, um, on Windows. Uh, when working with ARM, of course, the parameters are actually passed to a f um, when they pass to a function, they're passed via the registers before they utilize the stack. So register R0 will have the first parameter, which is going to be the executable we want to execute. Uh, so we simply just replace uh, the executable it's about to execute with Explorer, and then we should get a shell. Now, Explorer has to exist in the image for this to work. Um, if not, you can just put a copy of Explorer on a removable drive, pass the removable drive as the parameter, and then you go. And then so you get a shell and now we can actually copy the files off and start some business. And of course when I first had the shell on the ATM I was quite excited and I had it playing movies and all types of things. Um, they're actually really crap for playing movies by the way. Like a, like a 10 frames per second, it's not going to be replacing the flat screen anytime soon anyway. Okay, so now we can basically just plug in a USB drive and keyboards and copy off the files to start doing some reverse engineering. And then we can also modify the registry so Explorer will always boot. Now, remote debugging with JTAG over GDB is not the ideal way to debug any type of Windows-based system. Um, so, so we need to set up a better debugging environment, basically. And there is a way to debug Windows C applications without Active Sync, and that's to, to debug with Visual Studio over Ethernet. So you can simply build an empty project in Visual Studio, overwrite the local executable with the executable from the ATM, it'll copy it over, and then you go remote debugging. Visual Studio, of course, is not the, most, the best debugger in the world, but you, know, you, you have to do with what you can, really. So now we have everything in place to actually be able to reverse engineer the software, locate the vulnerabilities, and also test any software we create for these ATMs. So there's obviously a fairly limited attack surface. Uh, we have the card reader, but assuming you have an overflow or other, other some sort of string-based attack via the card tracks, uh, limited amount of characters, limited character sets. So I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's unlikely to be practical or re realistic, really. Um, the keypad, bit of a long shot, but possible master passwords may be left in by the developers. And then the network, so opening port, open ports, answering phone line, basically any options for some remote attacks. And then the various inputs on the motherboard itself, but of course this requires access to the motherboard. Um, so in my quest to create a Terminator 2 S hack, I came up with this device. Well, I wouldn't say I came up with this device. I basically stole the details and made this device. But essentially, it's a uh, media player hooked up to a NAMP, which is hooked up to an electromagnet. And you can create web files, um, which essentially um, contain magstripe data. So when you plug in the electromagnet, flick on the switch, play the web, and the ATM thinks it's just read a, read a magstripe card. Um, worked, worked great, but didn't help at all for finding vulnerabilities. But, you know, a few failures always on the way, but that's how it works, I suppose. So the walk-up attack. Uh, the goal, of course, is to be able to execute code on these ATMs. Now the cash dispenser itself is housed at the very least by a safe, and that's if you take the cheapest option. If you upgrade, you know you can get a fairly heavy duty vault. But the motherboard on the other hand is protected by a uh, one key fits all lock. So this is standard practice across the board with all ATMs, um, all standalone ATMs from the smaller retails, Triton Tranex through to NCR and Debold as well. Uh, Debold keys were a little harder to find, but now that I looked on eBay, they're out there too. Um, and of course, like anything else on the internet, these keys are easy, easily available to buy. Uh, buy now for $10.78, I think it's a bit of a rip-off for a key if you ask me, but you know, not with the access that you gain from it, I suppose. 
So now with the master key, uh, you have access to the USB slots and whatever other inputs. So now you can uh, pop open the motherboard compartment, insert a USB in a couple of seconds, certainly a lot faster than installing the skimmer. Now of course, the, uh, there's still a possibility of detection, but I suppose that's a great thing about these retail style ATMs that, you know, often out by the restroom, sort of tucked away, and yes, that whole ATM psychology comes into play too, you know, it's considered kind of rude to look over the shoulder of uh, someone using an ATM. And of course, look, going with, by the social engineering talk earlier, you know, if you just have your dicky shirt on with a Tranex logo or whatever it may be, no one's going to blink an eyelid, I'm sure. Actually, speaking of uh, blinking an eyelid or not blinking one, um, when we took the ATMs to Vegas, I was thinking this is going to be a bit of a nightmare to get these ATMs into a casino. And so we had actually driven these ATMs nine hours from San Jose. Of course, the whole time I'm thinking, man, if we get pulled over for this with two ATMs, 6,000 notes of fake currency, what on earth are you lads up to, right? But anyway, we managed to get there without an issue, and I had a contact, a security contact at the casino, and I called him up, and of course he's in bed as sleep, wasn't even there, and he said, uh, oh, I've got this other guy, it's going to take about an hour for him to get there. So we were just getting, getting, getting kind of pissed off, and then uh, so I just asked the bellboys, I was like, hey lads, can you help us with these ATMs? They were like, oh, he's a bit heavy, but yeah, sure. Threw him on the trolley, wheeled him through the casino, up to the room, left the trolley with us, whole time, no one, no one even gave us a second look, hey. So I'm thinking, what could you take into Vegas, which is actually going to arouse some suspicion, but anyway. <laughs> Um, so anyway, back to it. All ATMs need a way to upgrade their firmware. And this is most often leveraged via uh, the removable drives. So the ATM application will check the drive for a valid upgrade. If a valid upgrade is found or valid firmware is found, it will upgrade, install whatever we decide to add in there. Now, of course, the uh, firmware is typically a proprietary format. Um, the executables are encapsulated in the firmware. There's encryption, checksums, and whatnot. But these algorithms are very easy easily reversed just by reversing the ATM side code. And once you can create your own firmware package that adheres to the correct format, you can upgrade, but we'll upgrade of course with a few modifications. Um, now the more important attack in my opinion is the remote attack. Now pretty much all ATMs running some form of Windows uh, support some form of remote monitoring or remote configuration. So this allows you to log into your ATM, uh, change the splash screens, retrieve the settings, get stats of how many people use the ATM that day, all that type of thing. Now. Uh, another useful feature is the ability to remotely upgrade the software on the device. Now this is sometimes a feature, but it's always something that could be leveraged through a remote vulnerability. Now of course authentication is required to be able to do anything remotely, and this particular model I'll be demonstrating on required both a serial number and two passwords. Um, and also every time you made a connection to the ATM, there was a five second delay forced. So you know, brute force is basically out of the question. So of course we require a vulnerability in that authentication process itself, and it just so happens. <laughs> Uh, so introducing Billinger, which is a tool, I, uh, my remote ATM attack or administration tool, whichever way you want to look at it. Billinger, of course, named after the bank robber. Um, so we talked about loading code locally on the ATM with a master key and a flash drive. But of course the obvious drawback is you have to interact with the machine itself. So Dillinger uh, takes advantage of a fairly severe vulnerability that I found within the actual remote authentication. Um, and interestingly, although most operators don't use this RMS, this remote management, it's enabled by default on all of these ATMs as they ship out. And they say there's about 460,000 uh, ATMs in North America, and Tranex claims sales for 130,000 of them. So it's a lot of uh, a lot of default ATMs remote that are vulnerable to. Um, to a remote vulnerability, so cha -ching. Anyway, so typically to log into the ATM remotely, um, of course it requires, as I said, knowledge of the serial number and the password, um, but I can bypass all authentication on the device and the attack is 100% reliable. Of course I'm going to say it's 100% reliable and uh, this will be the one day where it won't be, but we'll see. So Dillinger supports both uh, TCP IP and dial-up and I heard through a fairly knowledgeable source that 
approximately 95% of these standalone type ATMs are, um, are using a dial-up connection. Now, of course, back in the day, finding an ATM over the phone line would be nights and weeks of war dialing, but now with tools like uh, HD, Moore, HD Moore's Warbox, you can essentially map out an entire 10,000 number, 10, number exchange literally in a few hours. Now, you map out all the modems, simply uh, create a tool which will find those specific ATMs, because, of course, the ATMs respond in a specific way. They don't say, hey, I'm an ATM, but, uh, you know, they have their own proprietary protocol. So it's, uh, it's not too hard. Uh, so with Dillinger, you can manage an unlimited amount of ATMs through its interface. So you could add a group, say a city. So you say you add New York. Under the, that group, you add each individual phone number or IP of the ATMs that you found. Now, the heart of the tool, of course, is the authentication bypass. So and that's a stepping stone to doing anything useful. So. Um, so one feature in Dillinger is to be able to test the bypass in a way that actually doesn't modify anything on the ATM at all. It just confirms that the, this ATM is vulnerable to, this, uh, to that vulnerability. So the obvious problem when you find this remote ATM is that you have no idea of the location. So Dillinger can also pull the uh, ATM settings from the device. And you know when you use an ATM, the bottom of the receipt always has like uh, the location or the name of the business and whatnot. So a little bit of Googling and not too hard to track down. Um, upload the rootkit, so the rootkit I've created, which isn't a bad feature, so it bypasses authentication, will initiate a software upload, and will basically replace the firmware on the device, so awesome. Um, now, of course, in general, someone's actually going to need to be at the ATM if you want to get the payout. So I've added another feature so where it's possible to carry out an attack entirely remotely where no one will ever have to visit the ATM. So Dillinger, uh, so, well, so the rootkit actually captures track data, stores it on the ATM, and that track data can then be pulled remotely. And, of course, the remote jackpot, which I suppose speaks for itself, really. Um, so introducing Scrooge, and Scrooge is the rootkit that I developed specifically for ATMs running on Windows CE. Now Scrooge implements pretty much the typical uh, rootkit technologies you expect. Hides itself on the file system, hides itself on the process list, the module list, and so on. And does, does this by hooking our Windows CE syscalls, and essentially just filtering the results. So there's a hidden pop-up menu via this rootkit, which can be activated um, both by a special key sequence on the ATM, or by inserting a card that has custom track data. Now, it'll run on any ARM or Xscale based ATM, Intel with a few tweaks, but it turns out that uh, uh, x86 running on Windows CE is pretty rare, and especially in the ATM world, so basically didn't bother with that. Uh, the code, of course, for interfacing with the ATMs has to be customized for different models, um, as they all use different peripherals with kind of non-standard ways of communicating. So the hidden menu um, just implements basically a simple set windows, uh, set windows hook keyboard filter, which captures the side buttons of the ATM. Um, it's actually undocumented on CE, but exists in core DLL and works as expected. So a combination of keys will trigger the menu, and it's varied enough where you know it won't launch by mistake if someone's messing with it. Or maybe a kid will get like a big payout or something. <laughs> Uh, now the card reader is hooked via an inline detour style patch. This is where you essentially patch in a branch instruction into the piece of code you want to intercept. The branch jumps to your code, your code executes, and of course it returns to your original function. So with the hook in place on the, um, the card track read buffer, if the track data 2 matches gimme dilute, pops up the menu. Uh, the menu is a menu function is pretty standard for what you'd expect from an ATM rootkit. You can dispense from each of the cassettes in the dispenser, uh, print stats on the remaining bill counts, as well as the master passwords and so on, or just exit. Uh, so with the different hooks that I have in place, I've got a few uh, inline patches. I have a hook on the card reader, the pin pad, and the remote command passer. Um, so with those hooks, I can add some fairly handy features. So I can save that track data, I can capture the pin pad, and I can add in a few custom remote commands. So with a couple of the custom commands I added in, you know, pull the track data, remote jackpot, might as well. So I bounced through that pretty quick because I'm going to give a, a real test of these of the demo gods here with this one. So we'll see how this is going to pan out.
And uh, if I get a little bit of time after that, I can talk exactly how I um, hooked to the encrypted pin pads and uh, a little, little interesting thing that I uh, found out about ATM cameras as well. Okay. Looks like the... Come on. the assistant. <laughs> How do I put this on speakerphone? Hello? Are you ready? Okay, I'm going to need your... I think you pretty much know what to do at this stage, right? Okay, so uh, hold tight. Okay, so this is Dillinger, um, and you know I made the interface fairly user-friendly. <laughs> so of course we can add a group. So we'll say uh, so the ATMs are based in San Jose, so we'll go to San Jose. Now we can now add an ATM, uh, Barnaby's ATM. No, 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 just hold tight, hold tight. I can't hear all this chatter going on there. Okay. Location, uh, Barnaby's house. <laughs> and I have this one over TCP IP. Let me just get the IP address. Maybe it's ATM demo. Seven five three six two four two one seven. And the port, which is open by default on these ATMs when they're hooked up over Ethernet, is 18456. Interest, interestingly enough, this port can't be changed. So it's a, that's an easy scan. Okay. So now we can right click on the ATM and say, let's just test the bypass. So this should connect to the ATM, test the bypass, and disconnect. So getting the connection connected, testing bypass successful. Now there should be a slight delay so we can hopefully see that. So now on the ATM there, it just has RMS process, and that's all it will show. And when that goes away, I can uh, start launching a better attack. If anyone wants to shop at Big and Tall, by the way. Okay, so the uh, the authentication bypass was successful, so now I can leverage that to do something a bit more interesting. So let's upload the rootkit. Attempt connection, bypass successful, initiates the software upload. So now the uh, rootkit is being uploaded remotely to the ATM. Uh, once the firmware has been, been uploaded, the ATM should reboot. Once it reboots, my rootkit should be active. 
Now if we go back, same thing, RMS process. Um, this is probably going to take sort of a minute or two to do this by the looks. Oh, and even though this is over the network, the reason it's somewhat slow is they implement their own proprietary protocol, which actually um, acknowledges every packet that comes in, and there's a slight delay after that as well. And of course, the, with their proprietary protocol, there's proprietary encryption, and you know everyone knows what happens when you implement proprietary encryption. So. Okay, so I could probably take a quick couple of questions while it's doing this, actually, if anyone has any. Oh, yeah. Sorry, dude. Is that better? No one has any? Oh. So does the money come out of any individual's account? Just of, just of the ATM itself, yeah. So only f well, the only attack on actual individuals is the capturing of the track data, which then you can retrieve remotely. Um, actually, I suppose while this is uploading, I'll mention something I found out about the cameras. So there's an add-on for this model of camera, uh, model of ATM as well. Um, the camera actually is installed within the ATM and can also be monitored via this uh, remote interface. So not only can you retrieve the images, now of course I could replace them. So uh, Elvis could hack the ATM or, um, or the dude who crashed out in my uh, bed last night. <laughs> Now, <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit of an inside joke there. <laughs> okay. Come on, stream. Okay, so now that's the ATM. It's just rebooting now after the rootkit's been uploaded. It's a little hard to see with the resolution. So when I when I first gave this demonstration, I was pretty careful to put stickers over all of the logos on the ATM, forgetting entirely, of course, that the logo comes up massive on the screen as it's booting up. So it was uh, it's kind of the cat was out of the bag at that stage. Hey, can you move the camera down slightly so we can see the dispenser as well? Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, good, okay. Okay, so... Uh, so let's get the ATM settings first. So we know the location of the ATM. Connects, grabs the settings, saves the disk. Okay, so up here we have the master passwords of the ATM, um, uh, the, the name of the ATM, the address. I don't actually live on 123 Kiwi Street, by the way, but I do live in San Jose. Uh, the phone numbers of the ATM, the IP addresses, so on and so on. So now, yeah, you can certainly map out where that ATM is going to be. Uh, so now, uh, let's see. Hey, can you um, enter the key sequence to pop up the menu and dispense 50 bills from the first cassette? <laughs> Try it again. <laughs> No, 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 it's okay. Try it again. There's the buttons are sometimes the buttons stick sometimes. So don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. So now that's that's my uh, that's my hidden rootkit menu. Actually, can, yeah, yeah. Zoom in on it a little bit.
Are you figuring out how to use the zoom? <laughs> Hold on, I think we may have some streaming issues. Can you, what's that? No, no, don't, don't dispense it yet. Have you already done that? I said, don't dispense it yet. <laughs> okay, I need you to do that again. Oops. <laughs> this demo is going great. <laughs> The stream's broken now. Um, okay. Okay, I've got one idea. <laughs> yeah, just hold tight. <laughs> Oops. Don't touch anything for a bit. <laughs> Sorry guys, it's a bit hard to get this one going. <laughs> okay, I think we should be good. Okay, I've got faith this time. So I set up everything so I can, you know, so even if everything fails, I can restart it back home as well, so. Okay, you there? Okay, um, enter the sequence again, dispense from the first cassette. Don't bother about zooming in. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. So now it's okay. So now it's dispensing bills. Okay. So you can go ahead and exit from that now. Have you got a credit card on you that you can insert? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I trust everyone here not to steal your credit card data. Thumbs up? Yeah. All right. I see a couple of people who didn't raise their hands, so I'm watching you, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So go, uh, hold on. Just wait till. 
What's it got on screen there at the moment? Okay, so go, go, ahead and, go ahead and insert your cards. Don't bother entering a pin, just cancel when it says enter pin. Just cancel. So it should capture the track data regardless of, like as soon as it's entered, it will capture the track data. So let's go back to the tool really quick. Get track data. Oh, come on. Can you reboot the ATM? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the stream seems a little better now too. Though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, don't, don't, don't touch anything on the computer. <laughs> yeah, no, don't touch anything on that one either. Okay. Okay, so my, I mean, my rootkit is loaded on this now, right? So every time it boots up at this stage, my rootkit should be running in the background. So once it gets there, let's try to grab that track data. Okay. Okay, cool. Windows, eh? Everything's fixed by a reboot. <laughs> okay, so um, so you can see the now the track data from from her card here. Don't look at it too closely, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, when I gave a previous um, demo, that's the card that give me the loot, which it also read, which pops up the menu. Um, another time, I had a mate give. Uh, He's another card that I rinsed on stage. Um, of course, I created a custom card for him. Do Dr. Raider, the Buster Cardi with the card. Leet, 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 leet. Okay. Now, let's, uh, so let's now send the remote jackpot. So this should, of course, just jackpot it remotely. So let's see. She's command, sending jackpot. We have a winner. <laughs> and there we go, so it starts spinning. Okay, so now I'm going to need you to do the walk up style attack. And you remember the walk up attack is simply pop open the ATM, insert the USB, and reboot. Cool? Yep, do that now. So this is with the master key. <laughs> there we go. Pops it in. Come on, stream, work with me. Reroot. Okay, so that well, that was probably about less than 10 seconds, I suppose. So, you know, someone who's used to doing that could sort of pop it open in a couple of seconds and have that done. So, faster installing a skimmer anyway. Um, hey, can you put your phone on speaker and put it near that, uh, put it maybe on the top of the ATM? Yep. Hold on, let me see if this is going to work. Say something. Let me see if I can figure the speaker out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so basically it's initializing at the moment. 
Um, and where I previously gave the demo, that's the, the logo floating around the screen. So it floats around as it initializes. Right now it's just initializing the dispenser and everything. So uh, hopefully soon it'll um, actually do the deed. Now of course, this, this specific attack I wouldn't recommend trying in the wild, not due to how easy it is to actually pop open an insert, but due to the actual payload I've developed. Um, not the most, it's not very subtle, and in the real world you'd install a root kit. Not, uh, not what I've got planned here. There's a slight delay, so you should probably see the jackpot sign there. It's, uh, there's like four sevens on the screen. Now we just need the ATM to actually give us some money. I know, what have you done? <laughs> Okay, you can unplug it. I can what? You can unplug it, it's fine. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, bye bye, you, you can unplug it, yeah, the neighbors will be pissed. It's like six in the morning there, and that is, that is loud, by the way. Okay, so I'd had her reload the dispenser. Um, and she's like, I said, like, okay, check if there's any stuck bills or anything like that. She's like, yeah, I did it, it's fine. Okay, so uh, what I can do is I can quickly show a clip uh, from where that was actually happening. So let's see. Sound here. Actually, I think I have a USB speaker thing. It initializes the little black screen. Obviously, apologies, source for the logo, by the way. <laughs> You're not giving me any drinks later, eh? So, okay, so basically the same thing, right now it's just initializing. Um, so the thing is like, so I had to reload the dispenser, but if there's any, if there's any bills that haven't dispensed properly, and it's caught in the dispenser, it's not going to dispense, so you have to make sure it's done properly. Second, waits for the loop. There it goes again. <laughs> I just want to see how long it takes to uh, dump this entire dispenser. Okay, so uh, so that remote stream was halfway successful, I suppose. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for thanks for putting up with that, by the way. So countermeasures, the obvious countermeasure on the standard, standalone style is to um, offer upgrade options on the physical locks themselves. But then of course, you know, if you're, if you're managing 2,000 ATMs, you don't want to have a different key for every different ATM, like some big jazz chain of keys, right? Um, but of course, you know, if you're just running a convenience store, you take it into your own hands, throw a padlock on it or something. Um, 
In Windows CE, you can set up a trusted environment, which essentially only allows signed executables to be run, and that would have prevented the uh, the walk-up style attack. Although it wouldn't have prevented the remote vector of the other attack, would have added, you know. Um, it would have added a bit of a barrier. But unfortunately, in Windows CE 5, it's really hard to implement in this trusted environment. Uh, not really hard, but you have to add code to the code base, so it should be a lot easier than it is. But what you can do right now to prevent that remote attack is to uh, disable the remote management. Chances are you're not using the features, so you can disable it, and that can be done from within the operator menu. I think it's time to give these devices a bit of a rehaul. You know, there hasn't been a secure development methodology in place from the get-go. need to play catch-up, have the code audited, penetration tests, and implement best practices from now on. And, uh, I can talk I'll just talk very briefly about the pin logging. So um, even though it's an encrypted pin pad, it has to also function as a general input device. So you can actually turn off that encrypted pin pad, pop up a screen that says enter your pin, capture the pin number, say incorrect pin, add a little bit of randomness to that so you know, so it's not going to be too noticeable. And there you go, you get the pins. Uh, the cameras, yeah, we can have Elvis uh, on, on video for the hacking the ATM. And finally, yeah, I guess there's just been a noticeable surge in the community, I think, for researching proprietary devices, whether they be ATMs. Um, you know, the simple fact is that the companies who manage, man, manufacture these devices aren't Microsoft. They haven't had like 10 years of continual attacks against them. This is pretty new for them. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about devices from coded by some pretty old school engineers who didn't really have sort of security in mind when they're created and they're sort of adding to these like adding to the code to add sort of new features but that initial underlying code base is pretty insecure. So I think it's important to dig in, research the devices, find vulnerabilities, find solutions and ultimately, you know, ensure a bit more of a secure future. So cheers. Sorry about the demos, by the way. <laughs>